Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lay. Joining us on the podcast today from Troy, New York, is Tristan Hernandez. Tristan bought his first rental property two years ago. And on the show today, I want to pick his brain. I want to figure out what he's learned over the last couple of years and what he would do differently. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll dive right into the interview. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. Tristan, why did you want to buy a rental property? You know, I had a decent job, but I knew that at times it was going to be a bit spotty. I work in manufacturing, and so uh, nothing is always clear cut. And uh, in addition to that, I had some volunteer work we wanted to do. So we wanted to find a way to have a bit of passive income um, in case there's a rainy day, so to speak, or if we wanted to travel a little bit, we'd still have a bit of income coming in. So that was the initial motivation. Awesome. And so you bought one property, and this is a a three-unit building? And you, it is. Yeah, it's a three unit. You know, we would have loved to have had a little one family house, but we figured we could do that in the future. And so uh, we decided to let this be our first one. So you, you live in one of the units and then you rent out the other two. That's exactly right. Live on the top floor. Perfect. Now, when you were buying the house, were there any hiccups getting approved for the mortgage? The contract for my company at my job ended, but it didn't end until we had closed on the house. It was incredible timing. If I had lost my job before the closing and the bank had found out about it, especially, they likely would not would have denied the loan. Right. But it went through literally two weeks before my job ended. So wow. call it luck, coincidence, a prayer, whatever you want to call it. It, it just happened to work out. So you, you closed and then a few weeks later you didn't have a job, but now you've got some rental income. So it, it, that kind of helped you get by until you found the next job. It really did. They did give us one month severance, but that's not very much, as you can imagine. Right. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, having the income from the house, essentially having a free place to live, but also because it's profitable, it paid a little bit more than the cost of living as well, right. about $800 on top of the mortgage. Um, so it was really a sweet situation to be in uh, if you have to be unemployed better to have a source of income of some kind. Yeah, and that's, definitely. Uh, definitely. So l- let's talk about what, what you've learned. So you have now owned this building for two years, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. and so h- how is, how has it been going? I, I guess that my first question is the tenants that were in the property when you bought it, did they end up staying after closing? One of them did. The other one didn't, uh, which was, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, bothersome because we had hoped to skate by initially in the beginning and have the monies coming in. Uh, but what ended up happening is her lease was up and uh, she decided they were going to move back to where her family was. She was a single parent. And so we did have to find a new tenant. Uh, but being brand new to the landlord game, we were really nervous. And so when she moved out, it took us nearly two months to find a tenant that we were happy with. We were also on a bit of a road trip and we had let the previous owner help find us some tenants, but we didn't like any of the ones he had presented to us. And so uh, we waited about two months to make sure we had a good tenant in the building. And how did you advertise for the vacancy? Um, so he advertised in a couple of venues, Craigslist mostly is the, is the big one, of course, probably for all of us. Uh, mm-hmm. but in addition to that, I went ahead and put something up on Trulia, um, kind of word of mouth. I even went on social media, let my friends know, Hey, look, this is what we've got. Do you know, anybody who's looking, um, here's the details, here's the Craigslist ad. And so tried to give as wide a scope as possible. Also put something in the window which I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that part of it because sometimes the people walking by are not necessarily the tenants you want in your building. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we want to have a big pool as possible to choose from. Right. So, and so what, what kind of criteria were, were you looking at when people applied? Like what, 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 I guess what would be a perfect tenant for you? 
Um, you know, obviously we want somebody with a decent income. We don't want them to struggle to pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And of course, because it's a source of income, we don't want to be struggling to receive the rent or sure. have somebody who's unreliable. So we look for somebody with a steady job, um, a decent wage that according to, uh, I think whatever averages you get, wouldn't, w wouldn't exceed, uh, how much they can afford. I think the rule is what one third of your, of your net income or mm -hmm. gross income. Yep. Should be spent on yeah, housing. That's, that's what I do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So check those numbers. Um, some people were below that, but were a bit of dreamers. You know, this is a, a luxury style apartment. It's not entirely luxurious, but you know, it was an, a kind of an upper range, about 25% more expensive than your average run of the mill apartment in my neighborhood. Um, and so we looked for somebody with a steady job who seemed responsible, who seemed like they were going to really take pride in the building. And that was actually something that's key. Uh, I didn't mention that earlier, but we wanted somebody who was going to love living here, who was going to love the neighborhood, who was going to want to brag to their parents about this uh, incredible apartment they have, to their friends and wherever else, um, that was really going to love it. And so yeah. we were fortunate to have tenants that really loved it, that showed it off, that maintained it so they can host little dinner gatherings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, how has it been with living in the same building with your tenants? Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily want my tenants to know where I live. I, I don't want them coming over, but in your case, you live in the building with them. So it, it, has it ever been, have they ever stopped by at a time that maybe wasn't convenient for you? <laughs> a bit of a blessing of a curse living in the same building. You're close to everything. You can see what's going on. You have a rain on what's happening. You can maintain it, clean it. All those things are great things about living in the building. Yeah. On the downside is like you mentioned, uh, you do live, you do live essentially with your tenants. Right. Um, has been a big issue. They don't usually bother me. They don't come knocking on the door or anything like that, but they do know when I'm home. And so they know, <laughs> <laughs> they know when I'm home to address an issue of any kind. Uh, so there is no saying, Oh, I'm not available right now, or I'm not home because they can just look out their window and know. Sure. I'm home. So <laughs> yeah, now, I guess that's a bit of a downside. What about for collecting rent? How, how does that work? Do, do they, do they just come over on the first and, and bring you the money or do you set up a time with them to meet them? You know, I wish I had it down to a, a good system at the moment. What ends up happening is when I get close to the end of the month, I, I, uh, I send a message out, a text message out to the tenant saying, uh, Hey, the, the first of the month is approaching and, uh, let's, let's schedule a time to meet up, uh, for rent. Uh, the way the le lease is written, I think I may want to change this, but it, the way the lease is written, and I inherited it from the previous owner who didn't live on site and had several properties, is he would have the rents due on the first Saturday of the month, mm -hmm. which allowed him to sweep through to all the apartments that he owned and pick up rent on those on that day. Right. Um, I have yet to change that. And so sometimes it's different every time. As the time approaches, I say, hey, the first Saturday is coming up. And then we try to meet up on an evening preferably not a weekend because we're all very busy and we value our weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to meet up midweek, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that in the evening. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you haven't had any trouble collecting rent. Everyone has paid you when the rents do, you know, for the most part, but sometimes because one of my tenants, for some reason, they want to pay in cash, the two roommates. Um, sometimes that can be inconvenient because they may say, Oh, you know, uh, I can't, we can't get together until later in the week because uh, I kept, I keep forgetting to go to the bank and get cash. Okay. Um, so that's a bit of an inconvenience where I'd rather them just say, Hey, I got a check for you. I'll leave it upstairs. If you can, um, you know, go ahead and, and send me a receipt. Okay. Now mm -hmm. what, what about maintenance stuff? Maintenance issues, I, I think is something that kind of scares a lot of people from getting started that they're afraid that all kinds of crazy stuff is going to be coming up all the time. Has that been your experience that, that all kinds of maintenance issues are always popping up or has it been pretty quiet? You know, um, it has mostly been pretty quiet, which is good, Dan, because, uh, you know, I'm not really that handy. I'm learning. <laughs> and so part of the, 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 picking and choosing of a house was we really wanted something that wasn't going to need a ton of work or, or cost a lot to fix up. Uh, this building was mostly done. It had brand new double pane windows, floors, kitchens, everything, water heaters, even electrical, all of it was, was relatively brand new because the previous owner didn't want to be getting calls all the time. He wanted a quality apartment that he could charge a good amount of rent for and not be bothered too often. Right. And so for the most part, haven't had too many issues. Okay, Although, 
uh, some minor plumbing issues. I mean, initially I kind of panicked with the plumbing issues and one of the furnaces had a bit of an issue as well. And being a little bit nervous about plumbing and the HVAC systems, it was a bit stressful initially, but it turned out that all the, the problems that were needed were actually pretty simple. Um, I'm also fortunate to have some friends that are really handy. I have a friend for almost everything. I have a friend who's an electrician, a friend who whose father was a plumber, so he knows a lot of that. Another buddy who also owns rental units, and he knows HVAC systems pretty well. And so uh, over the phone, they've been able to walk me through uh, what ended up being very minor fixes, which has kind of built up my confidence to know that you know, while these systems can be complicated, a lot of times it's a very simple fix. Sure. Yeah. And I I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up is that most fixes are pretty simple. Most repairs are pretty inexpensive. Every once in a while, you might get a a big thing coming up. Um, But if you have the right people, if if you know a plumber, you know, an electrician, you you know, a handyman, you, you can get this stuff done. And it's really not a big deal. I am the least handy person there is in the world. I don't know how to fix anything, but I I know people that know how to fix stuff. So when something comes up, I I know who to call to get it done. And I think that's, I think that's really key to, um, to making things easy. I think that's a really big thing, Dan, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, since you and I aren't really that handy, (laughs) people that we trust that aren't going to just, you know, bring us through the ringer, uh, you know, take us yeah. for a ride. It's really good because I'm sure that I could have called people and they could have made up a crazy story about plumbing and built this nightmare that had me nervous. And then I would have had to spend a lot of money to get whatever fix they sell me, right. which may have been way beyond what was necessary. But right. having family and friends that I can trust or maybe a contractor or whatever, who the person is, who wants to continue to have a good relationship with you so they don't take you for a ride, I think is huge. Absolutely. I think that's- yep. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. That's really, I, I think, one of the most important parts to um, to, to having an easy time a, as a landlord. Now, what about vacancy? Have you had any other turnover uh, other than the one person you mentioned at the beginning? So a little bit. Um, I did have uh, two apartments in the last two years to rent out uh, in this period of time. Uh, mostly circumstantial. One person, one of my best tenants of all time. She moved out because, you know, all of her friends had moved to a different city and she worked in that city and wanted to live a little bit closer to the action and everything else. Um, And so I did have a vacancy there. uh, But in that case, I was also fortunate. Uh, I'm not sure if you wanted me to jump into that right away. Yeah, let's do it. (laughs) So one awesome thing about her as a tenant um, was that she had come out of college initially, but she was a design student. The previous owner had ensured that her rent would be paid and even had her parents co-sign so that the rent would be taken care of no matter what. But she was also very responsible. She had two jobs. She was working as a design intern or excuse me, actually got a design job, but then she was also a, um, a waitress on the side so that she wouldn't have spending money, um, and also be able to pay off her school loan sooner. So she always paid early. That was incredible. But Mm -hmm. the other thing, this was huge in in terms of, uh, of, you know, having a low vacancy or turnover. Um, Because she was a design student, she took an incredible amount of pride in her apartment. She showed it off. She showed it to her bosses. Uh, Sometimes it was even featured in whatever blog she was posting about. And so she had an incredible amount of incentive to keep the apartment impeccable and in really good shape. Um, it was probably a pet peeve of hers being a design student. Um, so when the time came, she was very happy with us as landlords. And so she allowed me to take some very flattering photos of the apartment and even to show it uh, while she was at work and whatever else, which made it so that when her term was up and she was going to move, I actually had it rented uh, literally the first of the next month. So she was done on the 31st of whatever that month was. And by the first, I had somebody signed a lease for that That's time awesome. period. So I had zero, um, what's the term? Um, vacancy. Vacancy. Yeah. that That's really awesome. And th- that's something that I, I think more people should put that in your lease that, that you can get in there and show the property before the tenant moves out. Because th- that vacancy cost is really something that can kill your profitability if your tenant moves out and then it maybe takes you a week to fix the property up 
and maybe it finds you, it takes you a month to find someone to move in and then they have to give notice where they're at. I mean, it, it, the whole process could be a couple of months where you're not collecting any rent. So being able to show that property before the tenant moves out can really save you a lot of money. And that's, that's awesome. Now you didn't have that in the, in the lease, right? That was just something you worked out because of your relationship with the tenant, yeah, right? You know, something to consider in having in a lease in the future. Um, I tried to be a really good tenant. They knew that I was new to this. I would let them know gently, you know, I, I want to be the best one that I possibly can. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to learn uh, this situation. So they were very patient with me, but I also tried to be as best uh, a landlord as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a really, really good relationship with the tenants that I had so that any small request I made, uh, they usually didn't have any pushback whatsoever. Right. Yeah. That is, um, th that is really awesome. I, I, th I think having a good relationship with your tenants is, is, is really important because it, it'll help you be able to navigate different challenges and different things come up. So it, it sounds like you're doing awesome, Tristan. I, I'm, I'm really, uh, re really happy that this is going, going right. I, is there anything, a anything else that, that maybe you want to tell us about that, that has been yeah. bad or has it been a, a, a very good experience? Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, being really new to this and a little bit nervous about jumping into something like this, I'm not sure we mentioned this earlier, Dan, but, uh, when I bought the house, I was only 25 years old. So <laughs> didn't have any experience with this. My parents didn't do anything with apartments or anything like that. Um, you know, so it, it, I was very much so an amateur and an outsider to this entire atmosphere. Um, what ended up happening though, is when I moved in, I, I kind of spoke to all my neighbors in the neighborhood and, uh, let them know that I care about the neighborhood very much and I want to be a good neighbor. So I had established a good rapport with them. And one of them who also owned an apartment, uh, you know, three family in the area invited me to a landlord club that they have in which they hosted dinner once a month. And they'll have keynote speakers that will address an issue very pertinent to landlords in our area. Um, so what's really cool about that is we get to know any change in laws, any change in circumstances, any new developments that are happening to landlords. But also at the end of it, um, other landlords will speak up about an experience they've had, a lesson that they learned. And if you have an issue, you can discuss it as a group. So that allows me to kind of... Uh, pull from the knowledge of people yeah. that have been doing this for decades who own, you know, 20, 30 plus buildings who have an incredible amount of experience so that I don't have to make any of the mistakes that they made. I get to glean from all right. of that knowledge. So that's huge. If somebody's a really an amateur and new to this entirely, I would say that they maybe should subscribe to podcasts like yours, um, you know, go on to the, on any online websites that are discussing these things, but especially try to find mentors or a club that you can join so that you really have some knowledge to pull from. I think that is great advice. Having good mentors, having a, a network of people you can lean on, I, I think is just so important in this business. Well, Tristan, I'm so happy that things are going great for you. And I, I wish you continued success in building out your portfolio. Absolutely. Thank you very much, okay. Dan, for having me. Um, I, I want to mention just one more thing to your listeners. Um, I was a first time home buyer, which allowed me to only have to put a very small percentage down on the house. So all of the things that many people are worried about jumping into this lack of experience, not being handy, all of those things can really work out anyway, as long as you're willing to jump in and you make wise decisions. Uh, putting a le low amount down, letting a three family be your first home and gleaning from the knowledge of other people. Those are all the things that maybe people from the outside are really nervous about jumping into. Uh, but all the things that we discussed and, and, uh, you know, all the information that's out there can really help you to overcome those hurdles. You know, and that's, that's a good point. Well, one last thing I, I want to ask you before we wrap right. things up. Sure. Now, a, a lot of people are terrified to get started. Um, and you got started and you were pretty young. How, like, how much do you think you need to learn before you take action? Because that, that's always, uh, I think, something that people struggle with is they feel like they need to know everything before they get started. But I, I feel like it, it's a, a delicate balance where you need to have some knowledge before you get going, but you don't need to necessarily know every little thing before you get going. 
So what, what do you think, like, what, what do you think someone should, uh, how much do you think someone should learn before they get going? You know, obviously they definitely want to know the basics. They want to know the situations that could arise. Um, that way, if they decide to buy, they can try to skirt around those major issues ahead of time, making sure that they buy a building that doesn't need an incredible amount of work uh, right away unless they're really handy. Uh, that isn't going to be too stressful for them. So I think it's very in the middle. You don't want to do so much research and so much things that you scare yourself away from it. If you want to find horror stories, you can definitely find them. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what. Having a significant income, nearly $24,000 a year is generated from this apartment, um, is worthwhile, especially as a first-time home buyer, because you may be worried about all these things, but the success that you're going to have if you make a good decision and jump into it, I think far exceeds that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to be making yeah. money. You're going to be experiencing these things. And, you know, if you really hate it, then you can always sell it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks a lot for coming on the show. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing your story. Thank you very much for your podcast. It's been a huge reason as to why I purchased and, and why I continue to think about purchasing in the future. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for listening. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.